Hi, it's nice to meet so many new friends. My name is Stephanie Ingmeyer, and I'm here in Minnesota. I'm an illustrator that specializes in maps, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, is about how my world is growing, and it's kind of verging into your world. So let me get this up. Hold on a let me turn my camera off. And don't forget to ask questions throughout the presentation so that I can answer them at the end. So the growth of fantasy cartography, a guide by me, Xing. Xing is my pen name and I'm known mostly online through Xing. I am a self-made illustrator that specializes in fantasy and art artistic cartographic pieces. What exactly do I do? Well, I started drawing maps back in 2009 just for fun, and I was successful through the use of social media, specifically Instagram and Facebook. All of my maps are hand-drawn, and I am now able to draw maps full-time if I choose to. I draw maps for publishing companies, authors, uh, creators of board games, and mostly fans and enthusiasts. And I have used a, or I've drawn a map for a prop in a movie before. On the screen is one of my own original maps that I created for a dice company to use on their trays and back um, screens for Dungeons and Dragons. What is fantasy cartography and where did these maps originate from? Fantasy cartography is a type of map design that is a visual representation of fictionary locations. Oftentimes, real world geography and topography are mixed with fantasy elements to bring a world to life. These maps are used in modern and classic literature mostly. There are multiple elements that make up a fantasy map. First, there's techniques, such as are they topographic, topological, hand-drawn, or digital. And they're usually focused on territory. Oftentimes, these maps only show countries or part of the continent rather than the entire world. This gives a feel of exclusiveness, and it provokes a mystery and help, can sometimes help uh, with the layout of the story. Sometimes maps are based on real-world locations. George R. R. Martin revealed that the fictional content of Westeros from the TV show Game of Thrones is in fact based on an inverted map of Britain and Ireland. And then there's design. The style from the maps sometimes can be tanned to look like a map of Mundi or a Renaissance medieval map, and it makes the continents yellow to look like vellum. Sometimes they're brightly colored, and sometimes they are monochrome or all black and white. There's perspective, such as is it isometric or aerial? And of course, there's always a reflection of the, of the artist's natural art skills and discretion. The first, fantasy maps. When you think about fantasy maps, usually Tolkien comes to mind. But there's another map that many not usually think of. The map from Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels is an adventure story involving several voyages of Gulliver who travels to several unknown islands. Gulliver's map is of Lilliput and Blefuscu, which appeared in 1726. The Hobbit is about a mythical team of dwarves and a famous hobbit that goes on a treasure hunt. Thror's map was drawn in 1937. Tolkien's world is entirely original, while Swift's is based on the real world. So which map is the first true fantasy map? Do we base it on the story or on the land? And that is another topic for, for perhaps next year. Why are maps used in fantasy stories? The maps usually show where the characters in the stories are traveling to and provide comprehension on how far the, tra the characters have traveled. 
They are also used to immerse the readers into the stories through detail and relevance. Oftentimes, the maps are for the reader and are rarely used for the people in the book. How do fantasy maps correlate to modern maps? Both are used as visual guides. They let history and myth coexist on paper. They can be tools to help plot stories and games, and they can, be all, they can both be used as props and memorabilia. And who uses fantasy cartography? Authors, they use it in modern and classic literature. Uh, tabletop role-playing companies such, such as uh, Witches of the Coast, Dungeons and Dragons, Paizo, who uses and does Pathfinders and Starfinders, Critical Role, and Homebrewers, which are people who make their own campaigns themselves. The gaming industry, we see maps in video games and in board games, and of course fans and enthusiasts who collect memorabilia from their favorite shows, books, and games. Let's go over a few famous fantasy maps. First, we have Lord of the Rings Middle Earth by Tolkien. The style of Tolkien's map varies between illustration and cartography. Alice Campbell and the J.R.R. Tolkien Encyclopedia writes that while they have what Tolkien called an archaic air, they are not authentically medieval in style. The map for Middle Earth was drawn first through notes of, by Tolkien while writing, but then drawn by Christopher Tolkien, his son, in 1954. It was then officially drawn and published by Pauline Baines in 1969, and then Christopher Tolkien before his death drew it one more time because he said there were too many inaccuracies. Next, we have The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. This is a video game made by Bethesda Game Company in 2011. Skyrim was created using the Creative Engine System program. There are nine topographically unique and socioeconomic diverse holds represented throughout this game. The Forgotten Realms Faerun. This is a campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons, one of the first editions, and officially drawn by Ed Greenwood in 1967. The new movie is actually going to be set here in the Forgotten Realms, and it will be starring Chris Pine, so I'm very excited for it. And then we have The Republic of Taldore from Critical Role. This was drafted by Matt Mercer, the creator, in 2015, and officially drawn by Andrew Loft, the campaign series, in 2017. There are also additional maps drawn by Devin Rue. Why are we seeing map growth? The most popular coronavirus hobbies in order are watching TV shows and movies, reading, working out, arts and crafts, and board games. This is according to a study done by NerdBear. All of these hobbies listed can be, except for working out, related to maps. Glamour Magazine states, searches around escapism are booming. It's one of the reasons searches for fantasy maps have tripled on Pinterest. Dungeons and Dragons. A new 5th edition has come out and is playable for veterans and newbies. It has an ease in making homebrews, which are homemade campaign stories that, that the players themselves can make. And also it encourages the inclusiveness of, rep of representation. Also because of Stranger Things, a new Netflix series with phenomenal success that is heavily D&D influenced in which is a retro sci-fi D&D campaign come to life, and the children in the TV series play D&D as well. Streaming success. Live streaming, games, live streaming games is now a new sensation. Twitch and TikTok allows you to live stream your campaign. YouTube allows you to post and record your sessions. 
You can also voice record your games and play them as podcasts if you are camera shy. The most popular D&D YouTube show is Critical Role. It's a group of voice actors recording themselves playing D&D. It has had huge success through YouTube and D&D and is now a hefty part of the D&D culture. Multiple maps are used in this broadcast and in the campaign books that are sold and based on the show. There's also the freedom to sell crafts to your own online store, such as Kickstarter and Etsy. Etsy enables artists to put their items on display and allows buyers to browse unique handmade products from artists across the globe. Kickstarter is a platform for a variety of projects and the supporters can pledge money to creators to make it happen. The unique thing about Kickstarter is that if the creator does not get enough money, you won't be charged. So you're not really gambling. You either get what you put your money down for or you don't. There are also other sites too, such as Redbubble, Patreon, Kofi, or they could have their own website. Turning books and video games into series. We are seeing a rise in the nerd culture. So not only are we seeing comic book heroes and movies, but we are also seeing many book to screen adaptations. On Netflix, there has been The Letter to the King, The Witcher, and recently released Shadow and Bone. And also there has been Wheel of Time that's going to be coming out soon, the book by Robert Jordan. There are so many coming out. Another Lord of the Rings TV series from Amazon, American Gods by Neil Gaiman, Game of Thrones, which recently finished, maybe revamping another, se another series, and The Magician by Lev Grossman. This is important because books and games with included cartography are becoming on-screen sensation, which is encouraging. It shows familiar stories becoming big screen phenomenons and drawing in more fans and, pot and potential clients. We all wish to see our own stories be played out on television and our maps can become tokens and collectibles. And this creates expansion for independent map artists. Fantasy cartography and education. Fantasy cartography in the classroom can be beneficial. It promotes geography and geology. There's a use of real world places and geological formations in maps. I personally use a lot of Greenland and Iceland to make sure that my islands look correct or look realistic and don't look like jelly beans. And I use Florida a lot to make sure my peninsulas look accurate or look at least real in a sense. It prompts creative writing and reading. Both historical and fictional works use maps. There's artistic benefits in such, such as creative thinking, problem solving, and a use of writing and medium. And they both promote traditional and digital techniques. They, it can help provide familiarity with art software programs. And you could use minimal items to create a map, like, such as just a pencil or pen. There is a variety in art classes available. For example, Fantasy Map Inc. Is an, is an artist that specializes in graphic design and offers one-on-one -on -one courses. Artifaxian is a YouTuber that specializes in creating fantasy maps with real scientific influence. And C, Secular Eclectic Academic, Academical Schoolers Association offers online classes for students and homeschoolers. The future of fantasy maps. Fantasy shows are very popular right now. As Elaine Ching, an associate professor in the School of England and Theater Studies at the University of Blue states, I see quite a few younger adults turning to fantasy as a kind of protest against the diminished horizon of economic and other opportunities, against science denial, corporate capitalist greed. I see this as a way in which fantasy stories are a means for us to escape our daily struggles. When we think about it, these TV shows, most typically it's good against evil with good winning. So in the end, it helps us feel like we've succeeded or that we can see the good at the end of the day. 
We want to support our local artists. More people say they prefer to help small businesses and creators when we can. We want to help our own. There is this rise of the side hustle. More people are turning their hobbies into small businesses to give them additional re revenue streams. And there's so many more ways to accomplish that. And their self-success. People want to do what they like and feel financially stable and emotionally established. And also in addition to this, publishers are, release, are requesting authors to hire artists to, that specialize in maps to work on their maps and cartography for them. And so this is something that I'm going to be touching further on next week as I explore why publishing companies are asking for professional artists to do maps instead of the authors. One minute. Fantasy and artistic maps are going to continue to grow because they're an easy, hands-on art style. They introduce our familiar world with fantastic. They can encourage us to learn more about the Earth and broaden our horizons. I personally love fantasy maps and world maps of all kinds. I'm a world traveler, and so I almost always have an atlas in my backseat just to be on the safe side. Maps show us where we have been, where we can go, and how we can get there. Once more, I'm Xing, and it was a pleasure to share my world with you today. Wow, thank you very much. What an interesting presentation. Um, I, for one, uh, am curious to learn a little bit more about uh, how you can make made up places look geologically, I wouldn't say realistic, but maybe believable. That's why I use our world, your, probably your guys' maps for references. I always encourage people to use references. One of my favorite quotes is, you probably know you probably know what a tiger looks like, but that doesn't mean that you can just stop and draw a tiger. And so, oftentimes, if I see that um, the commissioning has a specific land formation that is familiar to the place that I can think of, I will use that area as a reference. I have used Florida's peninsula so many times; like it's just a beautiful reference to use because a lot of people like to use that tail. I'll use Italy because it has the finger finger islands, and so mm. real world references are definitely appreciated. Thanks, and and Jen uh, asks. Uh, she says, "Just looked you up. You do beautiful work. Uh, do you illustrate with a digital pen or pen and ink? What are your primary tools?" So I personally, I call myself a Renaissance artist because I don't know how to use digital work or digital art. I've tried multiple times and I've been an artist all my life, so having a pencil and pen is definitely what works most naturally to me. And so I do have a lot of friends who are digital artists, but everything I do is pen and paper. And usually what I use is nice strong paper, uh, heavy paper, pencil, and ink pens. Wow, that's amazing. So don't make mistakes. Yes, that's one of the things that's creative thinking is if I make a mistake, how am I going to fix this? Because there's no backspace. There's just me and my skills. Ashley Spice says, such an interesting presentation. My inner nerd loved it, and I would totally agree. And Morgan Height asks, uh, thanks so much. Did you find you have to resist making maps that look like previous fantasy maps you've already seen? Yes, absolutely. And then when you do see things that look familiar, you have to try and move it a little bit. There are some artistic steps that I take. For example, I never put a consonant in the middle of the piece of paper. It's called a mop, middle of page. And so I'll try to move it or try to angle it so that it looks a little bit more unique than anything I may have done in the past. Interesting. Uh, Stephen Hills asks, is your background in the fine arts? I am a self-made illustrator, so I would just say all of my background is just me drawing. I have maybe two classes, art courses under my belt that have taught me a, a good amount of skills, but mostly it's just all been me drawing. That's really amazing. Uh, how can people find you? What are your handles? So I'm kind of low-key. I mostly work on Instagram because I like the fact that I can just post pictures. I'm camera shy, so I don't do YouTube and TikTok until I really have to. But I'm on Instagram as WorldShing. 
That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. One last question, and then we'll uh, move it along uh, from Klaus Rinner. Are fantasy map makers an organized community? Are there meetups and exhibitions? There have been a lot of community growth recently, especially in the last three years. And we're really, really kind to each other, and we like having new people join in. And mostly what we do is we interview each other, and then we spotlight one another. And so I've been interviewed multiple times by other cartographers, and it's just so that we can help each other grow. It's a wonderful community, and I'm happy to be a part of it because I definitely feel included, and I feel like even just being in this conference, I'm going to tell everybody on Instagram that I was part of it, and it's going to be nice because it's helping all of us lift up and raise the next step in our careers. That's really great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation.